Welcome to this Royal Television Society event in the inspiring surroundings of the British Museum. My name is John Hardy. I'm the chief exec of ITN and the chair of the RTS. And we're very pleased that the RTS is welcoming Jay Hunt this evening to make this speech. I will be speaking to Jay a little later, and then we will have plenty of time uh, for Q&A. But we're going to dive in to the, the main event uh, this evening. It's interesting, if you look at all the articles written about Jay, they never fail to mention one thing, her origins. A native Australian who washed up on the shores of our country in her early teenage years, Jay has risen to the point where she can now stand shoulder to shoulder with other legendary Australians who have made such a rich contribution to British cultural life. People like Dame Edna Everidge, <laughs> Jason Donovan, Peter Andre, and of course, Rupert Murdoch. Um, but Jay's entire career has been here in the UK television industry. She started in television journalism and rose rapidly to become editor of the flagship BBC programme, The Six O'Clock News. From there, she went on to success as the head of daytime programming at the BBC. Then after a short stint as director of programmes at Channel 5, Jay became channel controller of BBC One. And among her many successes were commissioning hits like Sherlock and Mrs Brown's Boys. But for the last five years, Jay has been chief creative officer at Channel 4, and that is the focus of this evening. In fact, Jay's career kind of describes a perfect Venn diagram of journalism, senior BBC management, and deep experience in the commercial sector, in which she alone occupies the nexus, which has led some commentators to speculate that in the not too distant future, Jay will become the first female director general of the BBC. But we're not here to talk about the BBC this evening. In the last five years, there has been perhaps no hotter temperature recorded than the hot seat at Channel 4. The challenge for Jay was to move on from the years where Channel 4 relied maybe a little too much on Big Brother and spent maybe a little too much time lobbying for a £100 million a year subsidy and instead move into a period of commercial self-reliance, a digital evolution of the remit and the renewal of creativity. So tonight, Jane's theory will be the creative engine room and the last five years at Channel 5. Please welcome the Chief Creative Officer of Channel 4, Jay Hunt. <laughs> Thank you, John. I toyed for a moment there doing the entire thing in my Australian accent, which my team will bear out is pretty bloody good, but I won't, actually. Thank you all very much for coming. If you're slightly bewildered at finding yourself at the British Museum on a Tuesday evening, I know exactly how you feel. I am a reluctant interviewee and an even more reluctant speechmaker. Tonight, though, I have no one to blame but myself. I chose to be here. And I chose to be here because I wanted to speak for the first time about something that has mattered as much to me as anything that I put on air at four. Before you panic, I'm not going to bore you to death on terms of trade reform or the importance of Channel 4's unique model. This speech hasn't been pulled over by the press team or drafted by corporate affairs. Tonight, I just want to give you a very personal view of what it's been like trying to change the culture at four from the inside out. So five years ago, I walked over the glass bridge at Horse Ferry Road to start my job. I can tell you, it was an intimidating experience. I remember sitting in my first board meeting, so nervous of looking foolish that I didn't want to adjust the height of my chair in case I disappeared under the table. <laughs> I can tell you, nothing commands authority quite as much as a woman outlining a turnaround strategy with her feet dangling four inches off the ground. It's very easy to forget what Channel 4 looked like then. It had always been an iconic brand that resonated with young audiences, a, a buzzword for innovation and mischief making, if you like. But it was also battered and bruised. The recession had hit it hard. 20% of headcount had been wiped out overnight. And on air, as John alluded to, it could be schizophrenic. 200 hours of Big Brother cast a very, very long shadow. And the factual team had to fly the flag for the remit. To top it all, the creative team was famously cliquey. 
A snapshot supplier survey done just before I arrived made pretty hair-raising reading. Four was still the Indies champion, but the Indies were falling out of love with a broadcaster they accused of cosy deals with former commissioners and a closed shop culture that concentrated spend on a favoured few. So roll forward five years and where are we now? Well, today, four is positively bullish. No big brother, no begging bowl, no busted business ventures. In 2015, the main channel was the only terrestrial to see growth for all audiences. And just to put that in context for a second, for the first time in a decade, Channel 4 actually got bigger. There's been critical recognition too. Broadcast Channel of the Year recently and a record haul of RTS nominations. Now we work with around 300 indies. Even Ofcom, which has a regulator's lack of enthusiasm for gushing, has said the channel is in rude health. And we've even had some of Her Majesty's press call it a creative renaissance. Job done then, right? Well, of course not. We're still not perfect. There are still detractors, those who feel unloved and overlooked, those who think we could remain truer to our core principles. But even in those quarters, there's a grudging acceptance that something has changed. It's changed culturally. It's changed creatively. I think it's changed Channel 4. So how has it changed? Well, most obviously, we've worked with brilliant people who've made brilliant ideas and turned them into brilliant TV. Writers, directors, producers, editors, all delivering their very best work for four. But we've also changed the way we work. Why? Because anyone in TV knows that what we all do is a form of insanity. The roulette wheel at a seedy Vegas casino has better odds than picking hit shows. If you've ever sat opposite a venture capitalist or a frustrated finance director and tried to explain what we do, you know this is a mugs game. So how many of these breakout shows will you have next year? Well, I, I, I don't really know about that, actually. What about your growth projection for 2018? Well, I can't be completely sure on that one today. OK, well, let's keep it really simple then. How many of your current shows will be back next year? Well, I couldn't really say. It's not that we're spectacularly incapable. We've all just chosen to work in a uniquely uncertain industry. Over a decade as a producer taught me that. I lurched from the sublime, broadcasting live from the first multiracial elections in South Africa, to the ridiculous, playing judge and jury in a standoff between the late Alan Corran and Rod Liddell over whether he had cheated on Call My Bluff. <laughs> when you're at the coalface of production, and many people here tonight are, it feels exhilarating, but unpredictable and difficult. And guess what? When you cross over to the channel side, it feels exhilarating, but unpredictable and difficult. You realise very, very quickly, we're just all in this together. Channels and indies wrestling with creation and curation, fostering mad ideas we hope will resonate culturally for years. But the road to those highs is congested with failure after failure. When I arrived at four, I realised we needed to shift the odds. Or to put it another way, we needed to bring some science to the art of being creative. And there was some urgency. I remember the blood literally draining from my face when I first read the lofty remit I'd signed up to. In case it doesn't quite trip off your tongue, and I tell you, it certainly didn't trip off mine. Channel 4 is tasked with delivering shows that demonstrate innovation, experimentation, and creativity. No other broadcaster has such a non-negotiable requirement to take risks. And it doesn't stop there. Channel 4's creation was a political intervention. Its continued existence is dependent on us making a series of social interventions. We're required to prompt public debate and champion alternative viewpoints. I once overheard an American studio executive explaining Channel 4. She said, slightly disparagingly, it's a buyer. And of course, she's right in part. But it is also an organisation tasked with having a perspective and inspiring change. It's a bunch of talented people backing innovative ideas for the greater good of British society. But you all know that. You wouldn't keep trying to steal my staff if you didn't. In 2011, though, it seemed stark to me that if we were to have the most creative shows on air, we needed to have the most creative culture off air. Now, if you look at my upbringing, you'll be very unsurprised by what I did next. My dad, who sadly died at the end of last year, was a professor of organisational behaviour. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? He was fascinated by group dynamics and how they shaped cultures. And so am I. 
Creative organisations present a particular conundrum here because they're built on the notion that ideas are king. Many people, and years ago Channel 4 was no different, still subscribe to the view that the TV equivalent of the artist in the garret is the only real custodian of creative thinking. Right now, so the mythology goes, someone, somewhere, a development producer, a writer, a performer, is coming up with the next big thing. And they probably are. But can we really build a billion pound business on the promise of something that incalculable? Simply put, are there enough uniquely creative individuals coming up with enough high quality ideas to feed a broadcaster? What other organisation of scale would chance its success to something so unpredictable? And that, of course, is the point. We all tend to romanticise what we do. There's even a clue in the title. We call ourselves the creative industries. The implication being that other people in industry do something that isn't creative, I suppose. But of course, this tortured wrestling with ideas is universal. There are brilliant case studies from companies as varied as Twitter and Dyson. And the themes are the same. How do you structure to improve your chances? How do you tolerate and nurture a maverick thinking, but still deliver at scale? The whole mantra of 21st century business thinking is about leading for innovation. And critically, it's about nurturing a sort of collective brilliance. It's about acknowledging you have a workforce of experts. If a singular genius can't carry the burden alone, we need to find genius together. With that insight and my Harvard Business Reviews tucked firmly under my arm, my poor, unsuspecting team, many of whom are here tonight, <laughs> were put to work. An academic from Manchester Business School taught us earnestly about the amygdala function and how it could inhibit our thinking. This is true, I'm afraid. We had off-sites where we stood in line, most fashion conscious to least fashion conscious, <laughs> guesses for who was either end, to understand difference. We were involved in piloting a new personality tool which evaluated our powers of analysis. We learnt the theory of great brainstorming, the importance of always carrying a notebook, why it was vital to incubate an idea before doing anything. Frankly, it was completely exhausting. Meanwhile, someone else at four was doing something altogether my, more useful. My channel executive, Ed Havard, was sent on a management course to LA. It was designed to foster new ways of thinking, just the sort of thing guaranteed to prompt a mass display of eye rolling, I know. Now, Ed and I had first worked together a terrifyingly long time ago on the six o'clock news at the BBC. And one of the great joys of people from news, in my experience, is that they have a very, very low tolerance for creative airy fairiness. Ed was no exception, and yet he came back from the States completely evangelical. He'd seen lots of companies, but one of them had really impressed. Now, it's almost a cliche now in creative circles to talk about Pixar, particularly after Ed Catmull's excellent book, Creativity Inc., but back then, their unique way of working was much well, less well known here. The Pixar culture is built on robust peer review. Uh, at its heart, the organisation is defined by a belief that decision making is better when it draws on a collective knowledge. One of the central tenets of the Pixar model is the Brains Trust. It's basically a posh name for a meeting of the top creative team. And it was set up during the making of Toy Story with a purpose that could have come straight from the mouths of one of their own superheroes. It was tasked with rooting out mediocrity. And it became a forum to tease and test a concept in a safe, supportive environment. Now, that might sound like any old meeting you go to any other day. But the difference here is the willingness to be honest. Ed Catmull's mantra is simple, but it's incredibly difficult to deliver. He said, candor is the key to collaborating effectively. Lack of candor leads to dysfunctional environments. And I knew all about those. I'm a strange, controlled experiment all of my own, if you like. As the only person to have run channels at four and five in the BBC, I've seen several broadcasting cultures at close range. I think it's no exaggeration to say that collaboration wasn't one of their defining behaviours, and nor, frankly, was candour. All of them paid lip service to honest peer review with big meetings, inspirationally called programme reviews. These were studies in political game playing that would have put the Borgias to shame. A sort of retrospective, you like my show and I'll like yours form of point scoring. At four, that behaviour was even more marked. David Abraham recounts a funny story of his first meeting with the commissioning heads of department just before I arrived at four. They all took their seats expectantly and David kicked off. Pretty innocuous question. Asked them all how often they met as a group. One of them, who still works at four, piped up, well, we never really meet like this. They never even met. 
When creative organisations drift, I think what follows is a sort of collective neurosis. It manifests itself in the worst kind of hide-your-homework behaviour. Let's be honest, if failure is met by stony silence and success by plaudits, who wants to share a good idea with anyone else? So it was against this rather unpromising backdrop that we started to work in a different way. All the mad queuing up and thinking about thinking had sown the seeds. We would be a different sort of broadcaster, a team working in partnership with Indies to improve our collective chances. I started by organising two hourly meetings twice a week with my own team. And there were only two rules. First, there had to be food. Food was good for fueling great creative thoughts, or so Ed said. Second, those meetings were non-negotiable. Everyone had to turn up, no excuses. It's fair to say I still have nightmares about those early meetings. They could best be described as awkward with superlative salad. <laughs> Why awkward? Because you can't just announce to a bunch of people who've hardly ever met that now we're going to be honest and expect it to happen. As in any relationship, the trust develops over time. Sadly, as the trust came, the superlative salad went. It turns out Ottolenghi isn't quite as important to nurturing hit shows as you might think. Gathering in my meeting room went too. Trying to have a conversation about big new ideas in the same room where you talk about the lift refurbishment isn't that easy. The four hours went too. We just couldn't manage it consistently. Now we meet every week, first thing on a Tuesday, for 90 minutes. We sit on sofas in a room at the top of four in some sort of strange homage to the artist Garrett. It's called The Breakfast, but that's a misnomer. The only sustenance is coffee. We discuss everything and every anything. What should our response be to the growing number of unemployed young people? What would it look like if we take a germ of that insight and plant it over there? How do we capture the current disaffection with conventional politics? Three years on, everyone trusts, knowing that they're invested in collective success. It's become a powerful forum for finessing ideas. Imagine a focus group of people who genuinely got TV trying to work out how to get your show on air, and that's it. No one in the room has any other motivation for being there. They're not incentivized to help. They don't have a financial stake in success. They're just trying to make the good better. Creatively, it's become like turning to a clever friend. And critically, it's changed what's on air. I wonder if you recognize this. Now, credit where credit is due. No one at four made the island. Tim, Kelly, Ben and the rest of their supremely talented team made that show and they deserve the credit. It's a slam dunk runaway success. Audiences of over three million, a BAFTA, an RTS, a remake for NBC. A fantastic piece of work delivered by Shine. But the commissioners at four did help shape what it would become. In that instance, the breakfast added value. I think it helps. Not always, but often. Rather comically, though I've never really talked about it outside for, it's frequently referred to by indies. I'm often asked in meetings if something's gone to the breakfast, occasionally even if it could go to the breakfast. Why? Because what's not to like about getting some additional brain power on cracking a show? So one of the clues to how we've got better lies in lifting some of Ed Catmull's culture of candour. Regular, honest peer review has helped us commission better shows. Now, a lot of us have lived through the era of rolling out open plan working. Channel 4 was ahead of many in knocking down the walls. But it didn't bring about the openness and frank dialogue many thought it would. Turns out you can hide your homework just as easily in an open plan office as you can in a closed one. But forcing a top team to meet every week to be honest has changed the culture. It's shifted the conversation in a way bringing down the walls never did. But of course, this alone hasn't changed the odds for four. It's been just as important to learn to deal with failure. Americans have a brilliant oxymoron, some of you might know, failing well. On Amazon, you can even buy an entrepreneur's self-help book rather optimistically called The Upside of Down. <laughs> but anyone who's ever delivered a flop or crept into the office after a bad set of overnights, I certainly have, knows there isn't much upside to down. Failing isn't something anyone has much of an appetite to do well, and there's a very simple reason for that. You can spin it any way you like, but any business can only countenance so much failure before it too fails. We all know that, and yet statistically, the TV industry fails far more often than it succeeds. And for a channel like Four, with a remit to take risks, the commercial contradiction is even starker. Channel Four should probably always fail more than it succeeds or is not trying hard enough. Now, you can't make failure good. 
but it was obvious to me that it had to start weighing less heavily on all of us. I had some insight on this from my background in news. News is high octane, demanding, intellectually rigorous, but it also has the wonderful charm of being disposable. No matter how bad a show you've done, the very next day you get to have another go. And if you've made a terrible mistake, and I remember a few, not least the day I walked out of the six o'clock news gallery when we had yet again got the chairman of the BBC's name wrong, you are editorially reborn the very next day. So this phenomenon of failing and going again is even more readily understood in the digital space. It's fascinating to me to talk to people who've grown online editorial businesses where costs are obviously lower. They don't understand failure in anything like the same way. If you think about it from your own behaviour, online nothing ever really fails. It's just an iteration on the road to getting it right. Now, I won't pretend it's easy to take this approach. It's hard to change a culture in which flops are never spoken of and successes are lauded to the rooftops. It's hard to justify backing shows that appear dead on arrival. But as audiences become more sophisticated, surely our judgment calls need to as well. I've always found the idea, you'll be unsurprised to hear, of a channel controller sitting there, Nero-like, giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down on a recommission to be pretty cartoonish, to be honest. It's even more so now when data has given us so many tools to help spot what might work. Did social media leap on the show? Were the audience appreciation scores high? Did it deliver the perfect tick the scheduling team are looking for, where a show launches well, possibly drops off a bit, and then grows again? Did it have the buzz of early adoption in the press? These are all insights which give meaning to what a lot of people in the room would simply call gut instinct. But metrics help when you're trying to sell a vision to parts of a creative business that need to make the uncertain certain. We're not a bunch of amateurs. As creative leaders, we need to be able to explain our decision making to people who would frankly find it easier if we made tyres. At least then we could predict accurately just how many tyres might come off the production line next year. Now, the interface between creative teams and finance gets challenging at moments like this, but maybe it shouldn't. After all, it's a moot point whether it's more costly to sift through the ashes of a disaster than start a development from scratch. There's a book in my big pile of Harvard Business Reviews called The Collective Genius. In it, the writers talk in a compelling way about how reliant real innovation is on mining data. I'm sure that seems anathema to many people in this room. Aren't spreadsheets and PowerPoints the very thing that destroys creative thinking? Apparently not. Real innovators, they say, not only pay attention to data, but actively and voraciously analyse it. Let me be clear what this strategy isn't, though. It's not a shortcut to that moment of magic that leads to great TV. In a world where Netflix and Amazon tell me they can predict what I'll watch, I'm a complete refusenik. You can't run the numbers for surprise or feed my viewing habits into a big machine and tell me that I'll like something I never even knew existed. The creative flair in this room is still what ignites the flame. To extend the analogy, looking for clues in the data is how we manage to keep the flame alight. Simply put, none of us can afford to be so wasteful with our own IP. By thinking again about how to turn failure into success, we increase the odds. If you're still not convinced, have a look at this. This year, Gogglebox has regularly beaten all comers at nine o'clock on a Friday. It's hit the dizzying heights of six million viewers. Stephen, Tanya and the team at Studio Lambert, ably helped by the inimitable Mr Glover, have made it a cultural phenomenon. And it's not the only title that has become channel-defining from unpromising beginnings. We've stood shoulder to shoulder with other indies to grow shows. First Dates became a hit after we bloody-mindedly refused to give up on it. Similarly, The Last Leg went from struggling to get an audience of over a million to delivering double-digit young share and audiences over two million. Now, I may be Australian, but I have learnt the British art of understatement. Those shows are what I would call failing well. So, honest peer review and changing the way we deal with failure have played their parts in Channel 4's success. But simply getting people with varied backgrounds to work together has been creatively powerful too. It's known as thought diversity by some academics and it works on a very simple principle. Working with different people makes us think differently. Obvious maybe, but it's harder to pull off than you might think. Unchecked, we surround ourselves by people in our mould. Consultants call it mirror recruiting. It's a form of management laziness, I suppose. We're all naturally attracted to people who are likely to get us. On some subliminal level, we're making a calculation, our life will be easier because we're more likely to be understood. 
I, for example, am always naturally drawn to fast talkers. You'll never guess why. The irony of this approach is that it's precisely what we are doing subconsciously to make our lives easier that makes our lives harder. Teams of people who have the same skill set tend to create programming that speaks to them and not to the audience. Even though we all secretly suspect this, I've never worked anywhere designed to force people to engage with others with a different perspective. Now, Lenny Henry's intervention on the diversity debate has, of course, put this very theme centre stage. Let's be frank, we still have a long way to go, changing the makeup of broadcasters in terms of ethnicity, social mobility, even gender. But even working with what we have, there's no tradition of mixing it up, not at the BBC or Five or Four back in the day. Did drama commissioners shoot the breeze with the head of current affairs? You didn't bump into the guys from features kicking around a script with the head of comedy. But they do now at four. Maybe I'm overclaiming, but I think we owned the new buzz phrase cross-genre programming before it became fashionable. And that's because it runs like a th theme through so many of our shows. Have a look at some of the hits we've had over the past year. Ballot Monkeys, a scripted comedy with the topicality and quick turnaround schedule of Newsnight. Hunted, a fact dent show cut like a dock with embeds. The Murder Detectives, a documentary repurposed as a real life drama. The Secret Life of Four Year Olds, a science show with the warmth of kids say the funniest things. There's something wonderfully eclectic about our biggest entertainment show coming from the specialist factual team, our biggest factual entertainment programme being championed by formats. Some of it's serendipity. Some of it comes from changing the culture. Internally now, teams are actively encouraged to share ideas and work together. Now, you can begin to see the BBC and ITV wrestling with some of these themes. Last week, we were told BBC One will be unashamedly popular. BBC Two becomes BBC One's conscience. Working to a head of television, life will apparently be simpler. The BBC will be more agile, more collaborative. Meanwhile, at ITV, the opposite is happening. Gone are the super fiefdoms of entertainment and factual. The team will be flatter and also more collaborative. Both broadcasters are just trying to structure for success. But I wonder a bit if they're slightly missing the point. If we've learned anything from the living, breathing experiment that is for, it's that you need to fundamentally change the way you develop ideas to land something truly different. Collaboration at four isn't a sort of, you know, you all play nice bit of management speak. It's core to the way we work with indies and it defines our daily work as a team. Ultimately, that's what's helped us grow shows that really deserve that much overused word, distinctive. So certain am I at that at four we need more input into our creative conversations, not less, the breakfast meeting I hold with my heads of department has been rolled out to the whole team. Once a week, there are at least nine different groups of people kicking around ideas. The team who write our press listings and run our presentation desk have joined in too now. We've even got people from sales in the mix. In any given week, over a hundred people at four are discussing what we could put on the telly. In time, I hope people from all over the company will become part of this quiet revolution because they force us to think differently. And forcing us to think differently has led to a higher number of shows that feel genuinely original. It's also made us work faster, particularly in genres where mass audience taste is so hard to call. Comedy is a great example. Help by the Breakfast, Catastrophe was recommissioned before it was aired. Flowers, our brilliantly dark new comedy drama, was championed in the room, not just by my talented head of comedy, Phil Clark, but by our head of documentaries, Nick Mursky. Working this way, we can be more sensitive to different tastes, quicker to tease out problems, more confident pressing go. It's also changed our sense of responsibility as a team. It was a rather wonderful moment the other day when I started describing a drama we're about to air to the E4 commissioning meeting. Everyone looked a bit bemused, couldn't work out why. Eventually, someone piped up, yeah, we know, we all read the script. We've been doing this so long now that even our biggest calls, our dramas, land with a palpable sense of collective ownership. We all talked about it, we all stand by it. It's changed the very nature of the culture at four. Now, that all sounds a bit People's Republic of Channel 4. It's not. You can't churn through the decision-making needed to commission thousands of programmes across a portfolio of channels by putting every decision to a vote. In the end, like channel controllers around the world, I have to decide and be accountable to David and to the board. But those decisions are now informed by the most inclusive commissioning system that I have ever been part of. The success is all of ours, 
and that includes everyone in this room who makes shows for four. The misses get to be mine. I can't imagine us working any other way. So five years on, these are the things I know. Creativity can be led by teams, not just by individuals. Risking failure ensures you succeed. Different perspectives colliding sparks real originality. Five years on, here's what I don't know. How many unusual thinkers can a broadcaster support before their chaos means the work doesn't get done? How do you create a culture where people are safe enough to fail, but not safe enough to never succeed? And there are many more, because we're still learning. I don't think anyone's ever run a broadcaster like this, and we will make many more mistakes before we get it right. But I'm confident of one thing. If we keep evolving the culture, we will keep evolving what we put on air. I also know I've been lucky. Lucky because I've had the luxury of being able to experiment. For starters, I've had a boss who understands creative risk-taking. David gets it. He's been on the coalface himself. He knows you'll only win if you try, and then keep trying. I've been lucky too because Channel 4 is unique. Andrew Billen, the Times TV critic, used a recent column to explain why we persisted with first dates when it was written off as a flop. He admired our patience and our willingness to tweak until we'd grown the show into a hit. And he made a very obvious point. Someone focused on the bottom line wouldn't have backed a show it didn't make any sense to back. He's right, of course. Not having to deliver a profit has allowed us the space to fail. And being more pragmatic about failing has ensured we have succeeded. In the maelstrom of political noise we're living through at the moment, maybe it needs spelling out even further. I am absolutely certain we would not have achieved what we have achieved in private hands. So, five years on, what's really changed? In some respects, very little. I still haven't learned how to adjust the chair in the boardroom. I still feel sick with nerves when we launch a big show. I still whoop when things work and feel crestfallen when they struggle. But one thing has changed. My ambition for four has changed. I know now that four can be just as innovative off air as it can on air. Five years on, it's a different kind of broadcaster, a place where brilliant indies work with commissioners who are talented producers themselves to make unmissable shows, shows that move the dial not just here but globally. At its best, I believe Channel 4 can rival the greatest creative organisations in the world. And let's face it, who wouldn't want to be part of that? Now, now, Jay, you know how these things work. You make a highly original speech about your personal vision for creative leadership, then a dozen people ask you about privatisation. <laughs> so we will get to the elephant uh, in the room uh, presently. I'm going to speak for a little while and I'll open up to the room. But let, let me continue with you, the theme of your speech. Um, for those of us who have been in TV for a, a few decades, I mean, 20 years ago, uh, producers would say that the job of commissioners was to pick the shows that get yeah. made then clear out of their way and let them go on with it. What you've described is very different mm -hmm. from that. You've, you've, you've described a, an environment where the commissioners shape the shows, even originate the ideas, are highly involved. So I guess question number one is, uh, for those independent producers who are keen to know if their show has got to the breakfast, is it your impression that they share your enthusiasm for this proactive process? Well, I think... I think uh that it is very constructive in a number of different ways, and I can describe them to you, and I, I think there are probably indies in the room who've had uh, experience of it. On one level, it makes us very quick at saying no to things, and I say that as the first thing I say, because I know for a lot of producers, it's just as important to get a quick no as it is to have something kind of festering on someone's desk. So we discuss it, we think, is that going to work for us? No, it's not, we can move on. In terms of the feedback more generally, I, mean, I suppose, what, what would I describe it as? I often think, you know, we're talking about spending hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of pounds on a show. If you're thinking about any other investment in your life, and someone said, look, I tell you what, you don't need to get involved, but over 100 people who know quite a lot about this will give you some feedback. You can take it on, you can ignore it, you can do what you want with it, but would that be helpful? That in the main, my experience has been that indies go, actually, that is quite helpful. And instead of our sort of head in hands when a show hasn't worked, deconstructing why it didn't work, we're upstream of that, helping to shape it so that together with the indies, we stand a better chance of it working. So I think it's a pretty benign process, but it's just another set of brains trying to get something right. 
And the, the, the candor that you describe internally, uh, are you confident that that candor is also reaches its way to the, the actual producers themselves and know exactly where they stand and where they are? I, I think so. I mean, I think one of the things we've wrestled with a lot, and I would be fascinated if anyone could think of a way around this, I mean, because we've been doing this for several years now, I mean, a couple of years ago we started thinking, well, how could Indies be actively involved in that? How can we bring them into the meeting? And, of course, the, the fundamental problem is around commercial sensitivity. So I can't have the garden sitting in there discussing an idea from Ricochet because, for obvious reasons, it all unravels pretty quickly. But we've got nothing to hide. It's a forum to say, let's get lots of different people thinking if we can get this closer to being commissionable for four. At, as I say, over time, I hope more and more people will be involved in that. And if we could find a way of cracking that commercial sensitivity, I'd be very happy to open the doors to everybody. Just to probe it maybe sure. one bit more is the... I took a look today how many commissioners there are around yeah. um, in the commercial sector. So I think ITV has 17 commissioners, yeah. Channel 5 I think 8 or 9, and I think Channel 4 about 56. Yeah. So you are dealing with, in the 2014 annual report it said 330 indies, maybe that's yeah. more now. So you have a larger resource to deal with, obviously a larger a group of independents. But that's almost enough people to act not just as commissioners but as executive producers mm -hmm. most of the programmes. Is that, is that how you think things should be? No, definitely not. I mean, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about exactly that. And one of the more depressing things that I've seen happen recently is, is Indies begin to assume that will happen. And actually, I, that is not what Channel 4 is there to do. We're, we're not there to make the show. We're not there to exec produce the show. And actually, on my team are here. And I'm pretty firm with people. That's not what our function is. But are we part of a creative conversation? Yes partly for the reasons that I said at the beginning. We're not a normal broadcaster. We're, we're required to have a perspective. We're required to prompt debate and to engage people in, in inspiring change. So in that sense, Channel 4 is a different place, and I think you will have a different interaction. But from the moment I walked through the door, people said to me, we want to have a conversation. You know, I'm sure many producers in this room will tell you that they can't remember the last time they walked into a room at any broadcaster, put a piece of paper on the table, and someone leant over and wrote a check. And I think that's exactly as it should be, because it's a dialogue, isn't it? How do you make something better by talking about it and by getting the best brains you can on making it as robust as it can be before we get it out the door? So I don't make any apology for the fact we work in a different way. We're a different sort of broadcaster. And what you describe here is an approach also which reflects, it seems, a very personal vision of what Channel 4 should be. And it, the, uh, if you like, the, a personal way of interpreting the remit of Channel 4. Now, John Whittingdale said recently, mm. Channel 4 had a somewhat fizzy, fuzzy remit, and David Abraham was... Fizzy, fizzy, fuzzy ones more fizzy, <laughs> fuzzy, a fuzzy remit. But do you, do you accept that to some ex extent it is true that Channel 4's uh, remit is so wide that, that, that it cannot be totally objectively verifiable in that sense, that there's a little bit in the eye of the beholder? Well, no, uh, if only. I mean, I think um, anyone, again, at the Channel who lives through the many quarterly updates we have on the Statement of Media Content Policy measures will tell you it's a pretty rigorous way of assessing whether we're on target or not. I think what I find interesting about this debate is we're get, we're, some of these interventions are harking back to a sort of 1950s era of public service broadcasting, where I think there's almost an ambition we have double history on a Tuesday night and a you know, bit of double science on a Thursday night. And I think one of the things, one of the reasons we have evolved to work the way we do and I, I feel very strongly is at the heart of a lot of our success, is that I think we're at our best when we subsume some of those public service constructs. So, you know, Hunted is a show about young people caring about their digital footprint. The Island is about modern masculinity. Eden, which Liam's bringing to air later this year, is about starting again as a society, what different choices would a young audience make? So these are big themes that we're wrestling to the ground by applying the best creative brains that we possibly can to get them to engage with you, to get young audiences to engage with them. So I think when we go back to saying, let's think in quite a simplistic way about public service broadcasting, that's a bit of a backward step. And, and fuzzy or not, what's extraordinary to me, and you see it slightly in his um, uh, Rob Delaney's quotes on this, I think, is that sense that there is a place in this country, which has been set up with a pretty unforgiving remit around creativity, innovation and risk-taking. It's not something that we might do, but that is the best guard against cynical and pragmatic commissioning you can ever have. We are required to do that. And I think that's rather extraordinary and very precious. Now, <clears throat> moving on a little bit to privatisation, there seem to be two most frequently uh, mentioned uh, concerns about privatisation, one being the very notion of having to make a profit yeah. means that money has to come from the programme budget to do that. But secondly, the concern that uh, it inevitably will be an American major that takes control of Channel 4 and that will inevitably lead towards a dilution of the remit. But some might see a little paradox, therefore, in your, in your, in your inspiration mm. 
being from the very heart, the most American of all mm. American companies, Walt Disney Company, mm. his own Pixar for 10 well. years, yeah. has financed every movie they've made from, mm. from Toy Story. So from a creative point of view, do you see any possibility that actually working for the Yankee dollar could be good for Channel 4? No. <laughs> no, only because I think you're making a slightly different point. Do I think there are things we can learn from any number of sources about creative ways of working? Without a shadow of a doubt, Pixar is iconic as a risk-taking you know, producer in its particular space. Do I think that applies to the very complex model we have at Channel 4? No, I don't, for the very simple reason that I still think we are trying to do the hardest thing in British broadcasting. We are trying to make programmes which resonate, which have cultural and, and uh, social significance, but that also deliver an audience. We don't take a penny of public money. That's a very different way of thinking about the world. Even at Pixar, that's a commercial model. They're not there to bring about change or inspire conversation or represent diverse views. So I, I think in the end, the thing that matters most, I mean, I don't think anyone at Channel 4 is ideological about the privatisation debate. What we care about is protecting the remit and, and having, you know, as I say, I'm a controlled experiment of my own. I know what it feels like sitting at Channel 5 when you're making these decisions and you make very different decisions. Okay. And, and just plan for me before I move on, the one thing that is objectively verifiable is the audience performance sure. of Channel 4. Now, if you look at annual reports in the last several years, they've celebrated the performance of the total portfolio. Uh, now, we haven't seen 2015, but 2015 has actually been a particular success for the main channel. Mm. The all-day ratings are up about 1%, mm. peak time up 8%, 8 I think. ABC One obviously is up. So that's, I think, everyone recognises extremely good performance by the main channel. Mm -hmm which does all the heavy lifting for the remit. So the question is, do you think that is sustainable for the longer term? Or will there come a point where the, the total portfolio has to carry the whole weight of the remit? I think there are a number of things there. I think um, one of the most exciting things about where we are now in performance terms is, you know, what's happened in 2015, which was an extraordinary year. I mean, to be the only terrestrial that is up for all audiences and is a pretty amazing achievement. It has continued into 2016, so Channel 4 is still up, the portfolio is stable, we now see E4 up and E4 up for young audiences. So that sense in which is it robust, well yes, it is continuing to be robust against all of our key commercial measures. So I think what's happened over the past five years is we transitioned into a period where we've got a, a strong spine of shows on the main channel, good returning hits on the portfolio as well, and I think the overall picture looks incredibly solid, and that's where we've aspired to get to and we're there now. Okay, thanks. Well, let's uh, raise the house lights if we may. There are microphones available, we'll find you. Can I ask you that if, a mic if you put your hand for a question, please um, state your name and also please the organisation you work for if that's uh, relevant. So first for a question, looking around. Yep, to the back there, gentleman with the glasses. And there's a, yes. Uh, Edward Moline working for The Connected Set. Um, my question for you is about the digital direction that Channel 4 is going in and just in the landscape that sees BBC3 move online and certainly Netflix and other online broadcasters getting more attention and more eyeballs, um, where do you see Channel 4 moving, especially because all four with a three launch seems more of a closed garden when all the other broadcasters seem to be looking to engage across a lot of different platforms and a lot of different ways to bring in audiences from all over the place? I think lots of bits to that question. It's a really, really good question. And I think partly because of the way in which we super serve a young audience, us having a strong digital strategy is obviously incredibly important. And I think we're spending a lot of time now internally as a team thinking about the evolution of all four and how it can feel like a companion piece to E4 so that we continue to be a number one destination for young audiences. And some of that will be around originated content. I'm sure you know the success we've had in the past year with our short form strategy of 10 million views in a year from a standing start. So I think Channel 4 starts in a good place here because we resonate with that audience already and we have demonstrated already we can migrate them into a digital space and now I think it's about doubling down investing more heavily there and making sure that they they stay within that wider channel four stable but the other thing just going back to what I said to John I mean I, I also worry about the Netflix getting bigger yeah tiny bit bigger but it, you know we are still seeing huge numbers of young people going to main channel to e4 and we're hoovering up a very substantial proportion of, of that viewing demographic as part of our core portfolio as well so I think it's thinking about it in the round is how are they super served on main channel, have a destination top digital channel for 1634s with E4, but then there's all four complementing that too. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, gentlemen there. Hi, Sahil Seth, um, for Channel 4. 
Uh, with the rise of co-production uh, with uh, American broadcasters and American companies, do you see a decline in the autonomy of uh, British say in the production of programming, or do you see more of a convergence with uh, more global mentality and global programming? I, honestly, I, I think Piers is probably here, but I, I'm incredibly excited about what's happened in terms of money coming into co-production now, because simply put, I mean, from a creative point of view, my priority is I want as much great drama on television as I can get, as much great drama and as much great comedy, and it's extremely expensive. So us being in a world which we're beginning to see now, where Netflix are on the phone saying, we like your taste palette, can we have a piece of that action? Or we've got the big American studios coming in saying, tell you what, can you be our originating partner? We want to make it for you first and we'll sell it back into the States. Is a total reversal of where we were five years ago. And I think the bit that's fascinating is there's money there and an appetite for the sort of shows that Channel 4 loves and that British audiences love from Channel 4. But we're also beginning to see a drifting together of, you know, five years ago, huge issues between America and here about language, different language, about casting, around sexuality, what you could see at certain times of night, violence. Most of those have evaporated. So it feels like that sort of global scripted community has got a lot of money to spend and wants to be in partnership with us. So I'm hoping that will be part of the way that we maintain our scripted budget at record highs. All right. Yes, the lady over there. Thank you for a really inspiring speech, Jay. Um, Laura Mansfield, Chair of PACT and um, MEMD of Outline Productions. Um, you've shared your vision of the creative culture for the last five years. Um, can you share a little bit more about what you might see in terms of the creative culture for the next five years and how you are um, going to grow the next generation of indies? Yeah, I think you make a really good point, and I think our commitment, particularly to new air indies, remains very, very strong. And one of the things that I think is, uh, has been a curiosity over the past five years is seeing Channel 4 work in partnerships with smaller indies, grow them to scale, often see an order book that's entirely populated by Channel 4 shows, <laughs> only to see them bought by a super indie. So it's a, it's a slightly strange process, that, and I suspect that will continue apace. But, you know, again, a lot of commissions in the room tonight will bear me out on the fact we are still actively trying to court as many new entrants as we possibly can. I think one of the real successes we've had over the past year has been reaching out to the nations and regions and really making that meaningful for people outside London. So we're just going to have to keep doing more of the same in order to make sure that we don't get sucked into only buying from a very small band of people. And you know, the, critically, from my point of view, it again, it speaks to the same thing as the speech. It's about diversity of view. It's different perspectives. We need those voices coming through the door to make sure we get a better array of ideas on the table to grow into new hits. So I think the impetus from four to keep driving those smaller indies in particular will always be there. I was actually, well, while you considered another one, there was something else I wanted to pick on from sure. your speech. You, you, you made two humorous references to your shoes touching the ground in the boardroom. And I was just wondering if there's a more serious point underlying there about the gender inequality still in the ranks of television. Um, it's but mostly you know, it's, just it's true. about a chair, no. John, really. Okay, okay. So it was all, it was a bit bad chairs, not about the, the industry. Okay. No, I, th I you know, I think, um, you know, there's always, as I say, one of the great things about what Lenny's done is it's not just raised the issue around BAME audiences and, and you know, off-screen, on-screen talent. I, I think it, we've all engaged with it as part of the 360 Diversity Charter Channel 4's launch. It has to be about gender as well. And I think... You know, I mentor quite a lot of women now, and it's something I feel incredibly strongly about, that they need to be continued to be supported to grow in this industry. We saw a few years ago a huge flight of women from the sector in their 30s because they just couldn't find a way of managing childcare and being a director or sitting in an edit till 11 o'clock at night. So I think we've got to keep pushing to make sure, particularly from that age up, that people don't just drop out because they can't make it work. OK. And, well, maybe we'll just round off with one a more cheeky question, but it's fairly predictable. So, no doubt that you're committed for the next several years to the, the job you're doing in the, in the future creative vision of Channel 4. But at some point beyond that, what would be the ideal job for Jay Hunt in the future? I don't know. What should I do? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's funny. People always ask me. I, I, don't, I honestly don't think about it. I mean, I think... One of the strangest things, and people have heard me talk about Channel 4 before, and I've been really open about it, I think it gets under your skin in a pretty extraordinary way. I think you become religious about it. It matters to me massively that it is protected and that it continues to be able to do what it, it does and that it has the ability to innovate and experiment and to export great sort of shows around the world. And I, I mean, I'm not avoiding the question. I genuinely don't have an answer to it. I don't know what I'll do next. But right now, this couldn't matter to me more. OK, well... We wait to see. Well, for that, let's draw the evening to a conclusion. Please join me in thanking 
uh, Jay Hunt for this, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>